The tactics employed by charismatic humanism in its butchering of the second chapter of Acts and its massacring of the subject of sign gifts in general follow a carefully crafted agenda by the false prophet. Like all religious humanists, the charismatic leader has a false god, a false holy ghost, a false kingdom, and a false goal. To the charismatic humanist, Jesus and the devil were fighting in the wilderness over the control of this world. The goal of the new covenant, according to them, is to stomp out evil and establish righteousness in this old creation. When that is done, Jesus Christ will come back and take control of this world, and it is here that we shall live and reign in it with him. All of the marvelous achievements of the modern era, whether it's medicine, natural science, engineering, space travel, or what have you, is the result of the Holy Ghost coming into this world and giving light to the natural mind of men. That's their view. In that regard, wealth, health, political involvement, and all the other things that the Bible carefully and consistently says is never to become the prime concern of the church takes precedence. That this is a blasphemous and sacrilegious heresy hardly needs to be pointed out to the faithful Christian. In true Christian theology, which the charismatic humanist knows nothing about, this old creation is under condemnation. When Christ returns, said St. Peter in his second letter, in the third chapter, the old creation will pass away entirely it will be burned up into nothing by the judgment fires of God. The earth upon which we will live is a new one which in full keeping with the New Testament principle of death, burial, and resurrection will be reborn in immortality by the work of Christ and the cross. As for this old world, Jesus told Pontius Pilate on the occasion of his condemnation and just before his crucifixion that the school teaching ministry of the law was over. They prophesied an inevitable failure of the nation of Israel to comprehend and receive his kingdom under it had voided that covenant forever. His kingdom would no longer be of this world. That's what Jesus told Pilate. Everyone whose mind has been enlightened by the Holy Ghost, everyone who understands the mission and the nature of the church, realizes that we are pilgrims and strangers in this earth, we have no continuing place here, and we are only carrying out the work of the kingdom until Christ returns to take us home it is in this very context of thought, of truth, and of reality that the mission of the church was established and the Holy Ghost was given. The purpose is to give us wisdom to know the Word of God, the only handbook that tells us what to do, to have the mind of Christ to see clearly how this truth is applied, and to have the power to carry it out. Now we could go on endlessly about the willful, destructive, deceitful sins of the renewal movement, but it's not my purpose to do that. There are, however, a few phenomena that I want to point out before moving on. In charismatic humanism, as well as all other forms of religious humanism, or most of them anyway, a great premium is placed upon levity. We're bombarded with the saying, laugh, smile, we Christians are supposed to be happy. How can anyone see your joy in the love of God if you're not laughing and smiling? This is accepted doctrine in most of the church, but is it biblical counsel? Let us look and see. 
In 2 Corinthians 5.13, we read, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, we read, Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, we read, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a an helmet the hope of salvation. In 1 Timothy 3, 2, it's written, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant of good behavior, given to hospitality, and apt to teach. And in Titus 1.8, we read, A bishop must be a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. In Titus 2.2, 2, the aged men are exhorted to be sober, grave, and temperate, sound in faith and in charity. And in patience, in Titus 2, 4, it's written that they may teach the young women to be sober. In Titus 2, 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 tells us that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sober and watch unto prayer. In 1 Peter 5, 8, we are commanded to be sober, to be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, is walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Twice we are exhorted to sobriety, five times to be grave or to gravity, two times to be quiet, once to be meek, four times to be humble, thirty-nine times to possess humility, once not to be self-willed, three times to be temperate, once to be moderate, and once to avoid vainglory. Seventy-one times in the letters to the churches, the admonition is given to be quiet, grave, humble, meek, sober, serious people. Now listen to this, and listen carefully. Not once, not once in the Bible is the word smile ever used is not a biblical word Twice, twice in the New Testament, both in the Gospel of St. Luke, the word laugh is used. Once it's negative, woe unto you that laugh, for ye shall mourn. And the other time it's used in such a way to show that laughter is not appropriate for the present time. Blessed are you that mourn now, for ye shall laugh then. In the Old Testament, the word laugh is not used in connection with humor and merriment. It's used as an expression of contempt and ridicule. However, the word laughter is used in this way, but mostly negatively. Proverbs 14.13 says, In laughter the heart is sorrowful, and the end of mirth is heaviness. In this we see that laughter is like the facade painted on the face of the clown, it's a deceitful cover-up for an unfulfilled life and an unhappy heart. In Ecclesiastes 2.2, 2, the great preacher Solomon said that laughter is a form of insanity and of mirth. What good does it do? In the seventh chapter, in verse 6, he said, For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. This wisest of all natural-born men analyzed life as he knew it and concluded that those who spend their time in noisy laughter and merriment and smiling are people who are shallow. This is an escapist behavior. It is futile and it is useless, as useless as thorns under a pot. They crackle. They sparkle brightly, they make a lot of noise, they attract a lot of attention, but when the fire is out and there is nothing left but ashes, the skin of the pot has hardly been warmed. In the New Testament, St. James observed those who live in carelessness, sensuality, lightheartedness, insincerity, and preoccupation with materialism. To them he issued the stern commandment to be afflicted and mourn and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. 
And then, too, there's a carnality and a sensuality about charismatic humanism that is evident to those of a discerning spirit, not only for its content, but its testimony. The charismatic guru makes no secret of the fact that he associates spirituality with sensuality. I would hate, he says, to see the controlled, sober, sincere, respectful servant of the Lord in his bedroom with his wife. If he is not willing to let his hair down in church, then he must be the same way in his intimate life. To the poor fool who offers this analysis, we have this reply. In spite of the fact that the charismatic humanist does not know it, the assembly on Sunday is not a bedroom. Christian leaders are not animals driven by conditioned reflexes like Pavlov's dogs, as the charismatic humanist believes and teaches. And this is one of the many troubles with charismatic humanism. It doesn't affect your heart. It hits you in the seat of the pants. Those who are in control of themselves, as the Bible commands, can behave soberly, righteously, and reverently in the assembly. That has nothing to do with what this controlled and mature person may decide to do in his conjugal life. This pitiful analysis is far more demeaning to the person who makes it than it is to the person for whom it is made. If sensuality, uncontrolled emotionalism, laughing and leering constantly like a burned-out clown were part of the Christian walk, then the Holy Spirit in his authorship of the scriptures has made an astounding oversight. Seventy-one times. Seventy-one times. Seventy-one times. How many times is seventy-one times? That's a lot of times for any one point to be made in the relatively few words of the New Testament. You may not be able to find more than a handful of things that appear more often than 71 times. 71 times we are exhorted to be quiet, to be sober, to be restrained, to be in control, to act decently, to be orderly and to be reverent in our spirits. Never are we instructed to be emotional. Never are we instructed to be sensual. Never are we instructed to be noisy, to freak out, to hyperventilate, to gyrate, to clap, to stomp, to roll in the floor, to fall down if some two-bit phony thumps you on the chest, or to leer or to laugh. Never once, never once do you hear me. Small wonder the charismatic humanist does not want you to worship the written page. And then charismatic humanism seeks to establish an inner circle mentality by the argument that only those are critical of the ecstatic fit that they mislabel the baptism of the Holy Ghost who have never had the experience. Hmm. If there was nothing else to certify the brand of humanism on this movement, this one thing would do it. Every born-again believer has been baptized by the Holy Ghost into Christ. This truth is based upon the promise of the Scripture and not on some verifying emotion or experience. But to charismatic humanism, the experience is superior to more trustworthy, and more meaningful than the Word of God. This is pure, unadulterated humanism descended from the serpent in the garden. The man of real faith gets his truth by revelation from the Word of God, from the tree of life, and not through the corrupting filter of human experience at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Experiences can be misleading, but the Word of God never is. And try as you may, you cannot find any confusing, ecstatic babbling in the second chapter of Acts at Pentecost. 
In the Bible, and in true Christianity, no one has ever had to try anything in order to know whether or not it's good or bad. Originally, man was to get his truth from God by revelation and was not to establish truth by experience and experiment. In fact, this method, according to God, would, as indeed it did, bring certain death. One of the most successful lines that Satan ever came up with is, don't knock it till you've tried it. As noted before, our young people have been lured into premarital sex experiments with drugs and homosexuality by this catchy sounding lie. Many a young person in this world will live the rest of his natural life with a blown mind because some professor or some supposed friend convinced him that he had no right to criticize LSD until he had tried it. In fact, there is a definite correlation here. Many of the false miracles, the dishonest and weird out-of-the-body experience claims and faults, the unbiblical messages from dreams and on and on, are from those who have had their minds permanently damaged so that they are no longer able to know truth from error, reality from fantasy, by this emotional, mental warping of the mind, by the so-called and falsely so-called baptism of the Holy Ghost experience. Now, some men in the movement that I know are simply too honest for the unreal and phony pretense that one must put on in order to be initiated into the club. On the other hand, there are those who have had the experience and, by the grace of God, got out of it with their minds and their emotions intact. One of the great little books, if you ever see it, get it, and read it by all means, is called Holiness, the False and the True by Dr. Harry Ironside. In it he tells of a time when he was in the Salvation Army and everyone was getting this experience. Most of them wound up in rest homes for those who had had nervous breakdowns and other of the many bad fruits of the charismatic movement. Well, this is a fascinating little book. It gives us a real insight into this false world of pseudo-spirituality and the blatant fakery and dishonesty that accompanies it. Now, in case you don't know who Dr. Harry Ironside was, he's a past president of Moody Bible Institute and regarded by Orthodox Christianity as one of the most honorable and dependable men of the church's long history. Now, of course, I must tell you, he was a theologian and a good Bible student who believed that the Bible is the only guide to the faith and practice of the church, so that probably makes him an enemy of charismatic humanism. The Bible tells us, as we have just seen in 1 Corinthians 14, that the charismatic humanist approach to Pentecost, to the gift of tongues, to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and to sign gifts in general is all wrong. We do not need any experiences to verify what the Bible says. Blowing out our minds in some kind of psychosomatic voodoo ritual will probably leave us permanently changed, all right. But who in their right mind wants that kind of change? There may be those of you who do not feel that charismatic humanism is a big problem. If so, you are very mistaken. One startling example should serve to make the point. About six weeks ago, I made a decision to attend the 11 o'clock service of Big Valley Grace Church in Modesto. From 11 o'clock till around 11.30, I watched and listened to my confusion, frustration, amazement, and disappointment as the entire body went through the classic machinations of charismatic humanism. For a moment, it was as if I had mistakenly wandered into a praise the Lord service on Trinity Broadcasting Network. 
I won't take your time in describing for you in detail what I saw there, but I can tell you this, it was classic charismatic humanism to the core. Now, why was this confusing and disturbing to me? Well, the answer is, at least in part, that in 1964, the La Loma Grace Brethren Church, of which I was a member, supplied the property and some of the funding to start the work that is now Big Valley. It was certainly not the charismatic circus that I witnessed a few weeks ago that we had in mind when we did that. Pastor Seifert came out of the Grace Brethren denomination. He started out a very fundamental, very agile, very eloquent, very knowledgeable minister of the Word of God. But there came a time a number of years back when Pastor Seifert, a widower, married a divorced, charismatic woman. I will not afford Pastor Seifert the opportunity of lying to the Holy Ghost by asking him whether or not he knows that this was a biblically forbidden thing to do because the answer is a foregone yes. But like many successful preachers who have gotten more than their share of praise and patronage, Pastor Seifert apparently thought he was an exception to the rule that he had ardently preached and solidly bound upon others. Apparently he thought he'd get away with it with no consequences, but like Achan of old, now the forbidden goodish Babylonish garment is out from under the floor. Now the daughters of one of the top executives in Big Valley Organization has married a charismatic who has been hired as the song leader. There are there are other charismatic pastors on the Big Valley staff. Clearly, Big Valley Grace is tilting precariously out of control with respect to the Orthodox Christian faith. As a personal note, I doubt, Brother David, if you have the moral and spiritual force and determination to straighten this mess out it would appear to me that you have been locked in your ivory tower while the enemy have scaled the walls and overrun the sanctuary. But if you do have the ability, my brother, you'd better get with the program and do it in a hurry. The building is on fire, so to speak, and not with the fire of the Holy Ghost. And it's reaching critical mass very soon you will not be able to put it out, and perhaps it has already reached that state. What I have described with respect to Big Valley Grace is only one unhappy example of what is legion in the professing Christian world today. David Hawking, for another example, David Seifert's old minister, by the way, is now chained like blind Samson to the grinding wheel on a charismatic threshing floor. Seven years ago, Pastor Hawking sold his soul to the false prophet in order to get out of facing the consequences of his deeds. Like Balaam, he tries to continue on in the ministry, but is accomplishing little more than teaching the people of God to worship the idolatrous and humanistic religion of Zionism. Now, we'll have more to say about that unholy conspiracy and the other major player in it at a later date in connection with a different issue here in Acts. And so here are two men. David Hawking and David Seifert, who only a few years ago were among the strongest and clearest voices against the cult of charismatic humanism, now reduced to court gestures in the false prophet's temple. Now do you understand why God instructs me to speak out against this horrendous threat? This that I have just described is something that I personally would not have considered possible ten years ago. If anyone had told me that Hawking and Seifert would become apologists for the charismatic movement, I would have told them that they were out of their minds. Charismatic humanism is a creeping malaise in the religious world. 
Its power is not the power of man, but the power of the dragon working through religious humanism. And that's why St. James describes it as devilish, among other things. Its appeal is earthly, sensual, and devilish, he says. Jesus puts his finger on the problem when he says, Wide indeed is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. It is in this kind of religious circus where all the sensuality, materialism, emotionalism, fun, games, and earthly glory are to be found. The masses have always migrated to this midway. But the way that leads to truth is still narrow. There are still few that be that find it, but there are a few. And those pastors who know better, but who are sitting idly by because of one intimidation or another, will answer for this sin. They will answer for this sin. And we have tried to deal in this series with some of the subtleties and complexities of this humanistic problem. It is very vast and many faceted but it can all be laid at one doorstep. When religious leaders no longer use the Bible as the only guide to the faith and practice of the church, when experience, feelings, emotions, materialism, majority rule, and other descendants from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil become the guiding lights in the religious world, a trip over the precipice and into the pit is the only and the inevitable result.